uh, we all have critical race theory and um, lots of things like that. So I just wanted him to speak to y'all and kind of explain it and talk about it because it's really a hot button issue and I feel like we hear it everywhere like it's a buzzword and so I wanted us to to really know what it is. So it's all yours, Travis. Okay, great. Well, students, it's a it's an honor to be able to teach with you guys today. I uh, part of my job as a pastor here in Louisiana is to work with our high school and college students, and so I have a particular ministry and passion for people who are doing what you're doing right now. And I know it's not always easy, so I hope you've made it through midterms if you've had those, and you know you have probably some papers and finals coming up ahead. So I'll be praying for you guys. But uh, Renee, uh, it's so good to hear from you and see you. I feel like you and Brian haven't aged a day, yet I've lost more hair every day in the past 10 years. So it's uh, it's kind of funny to see you know, how time goes, but so excited for you guys and excited to be here. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started. And uh, if I have a few relevant points as well, I'll try to show um, images. It might be hard to see on the phone, but I'm recording this as well if you do want to watch it later. So as I understand it, this is a multicultural perspectives of psychology class. And in this class, you know, you're, you're talking about uh, the differences within uh, society and communication, thinking, processing, and those kind of things. And so as psychology and counseling majors, you know, this is an important topic, especially as you get into the idea of critical theory, you know, uh, as you may be well aware, especially studying at a Christian institution on psychology, not everything in the field of psychology comes from a biblical worldview. While still there are some biblical um, ideas that are observed because of natural revelation, which we'll talk about, um, we as Christians can observe and rightly interpret natural revelation because we have God's special revelation too. Uh, so definitely the world does get things right sometimes, uh, but without the spirit of God and the word of God, it can't always be spot on. So um, now uh, what I want to do in this talk essentially is talk about what critical race theory is, but really that's where I'm going to end because um, I do want to answer that question, but before I do, we just need to cover a few other significant things. So it is important that one states what they're for um, and also state what they're against. I don't want to sit here and sound like a, a, you know, a lame media talking head, just you know, finding cute little points to say, this is bad and just kind of, you know, treat critical theory or critical race theory as a punching bag for people to hate on. Um, do I think that this ideology is antithetical to the gospel? Yes, I do. Um, but I, I also want to show a sense of respect as well in dealing with it. So uh, scripture uh, commands that we fight a warfare against ideas and not people. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So before we address critical theory, this path we need to follow to rightly destroy the arguments of critical theory, uh, I, know, I just want you to notice again, it's not to destroy any people who hold to critical theory at all. I love them. And for those who have full sail given into it, I want them to repent. I want them to follow scriptures. And it reminds me of uh, the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation when Jesus praises them for hating the works of the Nicolaitans, not the Nicolaitans themselves. That would be sinful to hate them because we're to love our enemies, all enemies. And so it was really their false doctrine that um, was opposed. So uh, now that we've addressed a bit of the preface, what I want to share, I want to lay out my thesis and then the structure of this lecture. So my thesis in this lecture is this, that critical theory is antithetical to the Christian worldview and as such must be rejected because it is fundamentally a different worldview from what God has laid out in his world and in his word. So my structure will first explain the foundations of society and justice. And actually, let me repeat my thesis just in case you're a note taker. Uh, critical theory is antithetical to the Christian worldview and as such must be rejected because it is fundamentally sorry, fundamentally a different worldview from what God has laid out in his world and his word. So the structure of this lecture, I'm going to seek to explain what social justice and critical theory is and how those differ from a Christian worldview. Um, and so that'll lead us specifically to critical race theory. So often you hear about critical race theory in relation to the idea of social justice. So before we dive into that, I want to provide a Christian framework of what justice is. 
I want to tell you what Christians are for and then argue against critical race theory. So at first glance, it may seem that the current concerns of both Christianity and social justice are more uncommon than in opposition. So for example, Christianity and social justice claim to both be against bigotry, racism, and oppression. They share uh, concerns mutually for the outcasts, the poor, the needy, those who are suffering and, and wandering in a need of help. Also, both social justice and Christianity seek to solve the conflicts that naturally arise in this world because of sin and bring about, they are seeking to bring about some sense of peace. We, we think about when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall have peace. And the chance of those in the streets in protest, no justice, no peace. They seem so similar, yet they couldn't be more different. And in this lecture, I want to make an argument as to why. So first, I want to argue for the foundations of true justice, what I'll call biblical justice. So when we're talking about justice, we're talking about the standard of what is right and wrong. For the sake of clarity, I want to give you a well-rounded definition of justice that is explained from understanding these concepts from both the Old and New Testament. So Calvin Beisner, I will show you this uh, small pamphlet um, here. I don't know if it'll show up in the camera, if I, unless I go look over here right here. It's called Social Justice versus Biblical Justice, How Good Intentions Undermine Justice and the Gospel. E. Calvin Beisner, he is a uh, associate professor of interdisciplinary studies at Covenant College. Uh, he's in, um, you know, really um, well-written and well-spoken um, guy. Uh, and in this little little pamphlet, it's not really too long, he seeks to lay out a definition of justice and gives a lot of scripture for it, but I'm just going to summarize it for you. He says, justice is rendering impartially and proportionally to everyone his due in accord with the righteous standard of God's moral law. So that's essentially, there's essentially four parts to this definition. I'm going to break it down. So justice is rendering impartially. So justice requires impartiality. Impartiality is an equal application of all relevant rules to all people in all relevant situations. A good verse to proof Texas is Deuteronomy 1, 16 to 17. Once again, justice is an equal application of all relevant rules to all people in all relevant situations. Number two, justice requires rendering to each his due. So Paul instructs believers in Romans 13 to render to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And also in Proverbs 24, 12, it asks this question in, about God, will he not repay man according to his work? This is just a couple passages of scripture, but um, the principle remains the same. Each person has rendered what they're due. So that's number two. Number three, justice requires proportionality. A symmetry between the initial acts on the one hand and the rewards or punishments on the other. You see, the law of God, it also does a good job of making a distinction here between persons and property and how one might be rewarded or punished based off of uh, the proportionality and the acts related to their persons or property. So correct proportions are given in judgments by judges. And then number four, Justice requires conformity to the standard set forth in God's law. This is summarized, as you well know, in the Ten Commandments, but then the rest of the law seeks to expound on the Ten Commandments. So looking at these, um, once again, these four parts of the definition, I'll read the definition again. Justice is rendering impartially and proportionally to everyone his due in accord with the righteous standard of God's moral law. So these four things. Uh, imply that we as humans have rights, but where do our rights come from? Um, if Obviously, many of you are believers, so um, we understand that rights come from God. They don't naturally arise. Our founders recognize this fact, and although they didn't practice it perfectly, slavery being the obvious example, our founders stated that we have been endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Inalienable meaning it's unable to be taken away or given away by the possessor. Uh, these inalienable rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness being this idea, if you're familiar with the Greeks, of eudaimonia. Uh, sorry, eudaimonia, I said it wrong. And uh, this idea is a virtue, uh, uh, seeking uh, the ultimate good. And that is the idea in the founders in the Declaration of Independence. So um, 
Now, when it comes to the subject of justice, I laid out the biblical worldview, but even as we think of comparing biblical justice versus social justice, it all comes down to an issue of authority. Who is the ultimate authority in our lives? Um, if you go to Sunday school, the Sunday school answer, Jesus, right? Uh, we understand God is um, our ultimate authority. So justice has to do with an aspect of how we relate to each other, and partially according to what we're due, proportionally, uh, and conform to the standard of God's law. So we have to think about the foundation being God. Uh, he is the standard that it sets it. And so um, what is God's foundation for society? What is his foundation for society? we got to look at that. God is the foundation for all things. And because God is our authority, his word and his law are also our authorities as well. So this outline I'm going to give for the next three sections, what we're going to do, uh, it might be hard to see it, but I'm going to try and pull it up on the screen anyway, uh, is right here. I got to just hit share screen at the bottom here. Oh, can I do that? I thought I knew how to do that. Let me see here. Aha, there it is. Okay. So I'm going to share. There it is. Great. I don't know if you guys see this on the screen right now. Um, essentially, um, this is going to be broken down into three, three parts. If you could see at the top of the screen, it has God, and then the bottom left, God's law, the bottom right, God's word. And essentially what this is, is the three branches of philosophy. Up top, you have metaphysics. You have who God is. This, these are the foundations of society. God's being, uh, or metaphysics, this is asking the question, what is really real? Uh, over on the right, you have God's word. And this is a branch of philosophy that's going to deal with epistemology. How can we know what's really real? And then um, on the left, you have God's law, which is ethics. So we have metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. Ethics has to do with what's right or wrong, and God's law sets that standard. And from there, you have an infrastructure that's built. And those are the four things on the bottom of the screen, which is um, the individual, the family, the state, and the church. Those are the four, you might say, pillars or corners of the house built on the foundation uh, of God's being, word, and law. These are the foundations of society. Uh, and so in thinking about this and thinking about um, how do we think of the foundations of society and structures of society, we have to really think about um, this in relation, um, obviously, to every, you know, every worldview. As Christians, we have to assess the world we live in and the opposing ideologies that are before us. And so metaphysics is also, if you've never heard of that, it's dealing with ontology, meta meaning beyond, so it's beyond the physical world. So it's what is really the structure of everything. That's what it's seeking to do. And I, I don't know if I mentioned the book. I'm sorry. I, I got a little confused there when I was trying to get the screen share. But this book right here is called What Every Christian Needs to Know About Social Justice by Jeffrey Johnson. And by the way, I'll share a link at the end of this lecture that uh, Renee can share with you guys. Um, that will uh, have links to all the resources I'd recommend, okay? So, um, you know, continuing on, we talked about God being the, his being being the foundation for uh, metaphysics, his revelation, uh, his word being the foundation for epistemology, and his law being the foundation for ethics, those three things. Now, natural revelation reveals these three foundational truths, uh, you can write these Bible verses down. Um, uh, these Bible verses attest to natural revelation. So special revelation attests to natural revelation that uh, these things are the case. They're true. And here are, once again, the scripture passages tied to the foundational truth. So God's being, metaphysics. This is revealed in Psalm 19, verse 1. Maybe you're familiar with this psalm. C.S. Lewis said it was the most beautiful psalm in the Bible. He said, it says, sorry, Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So in other words, the created order tells us there is a God. He exists. So he is the one who, therefore, as creator, uh, is the one who structures all of reality. So that God's being the foundation for metaphysics. Number two, we know there is a God. Uh, Romans uh, 1, 20 says, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. Um, and actually before that, it says that the knowledge of God has been clearly perceived. So it's known ever since the creation of the world being clearly perceived means it's the knowledge of God is widely accessible to everyone, but it's also easily resistible. 
And you can learn more about that in uh, Craig Evans' book, um, Natural Signs and Knowledge of God, published by Oxford University Press. So uh, we know there's a God, epistemology, that's number two. We, we learn that in God's word. And lastly, the scripture to back up um, the one on ethics about God's law being a standard for right and wrong. Uh, Romans 2, chapter, tw sorry, Romans chapter 2, verses 12 to 16 teaches us that God's law uh, is written on the hearts of men and on their consciences. And so this is naturally revealed. Uh, and so those three things are the key foundational truths to uh, society and to the world. And we say that God establishes these foundations and he builds the framework through those four parts I mentioned earlier, the individual, the family, the state, and the church. But each of these four corners or four pillars, they have their own limits uh, of authority and jurisdiction according to God's word and in his world. So, for example, uh, if, uh, you know, each individual has rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but um, I cannot take the life of another individual, right? It's, that'd be sin. That'd be murder, of course, right? And what would I be doing? I would be leaving my sphere as an individual and taking away someone else's sphere of individuality. That would be sin. That'd be wrong. In the same way, families have their own sphere of authority. So I, I'm a dad, I have three sons, and uh, love being a dad. And as a pastor, uh, I, I have influence over other families. But I can't sit here and go to the child of another family and discipline that child. You know, that's not my responsibility. Now, I can maybe offer a public correction if, if, if a kid does wrong, like, hey, you shouldn't hit Billy, that's not okay. Um, that's, that's fine. But the disciplinary action of how that is ultimately resolved is not up to me. It's up to the parents. And so I can't override that jurisdiction. I don't have authority there to say, this is how your house should function, right? That's not, that's not my place. I can encourage, but I can't um, act authoritatively. In the same way with the state, the state has a delegated authority from God. All authority is delegated. I wanted to mention that as well. Um, the state has delegated authority and it can go too far. So I've mentioned how the individual can go too far. The family can go too far. The state can go too far, but also the church. Each of these have their own authority and jurisdiction. Uh, it's not up to the church to um, execute criminals. That's not our. That's not our job. That's the state's job. They they punish evil, uh, and they and they reward good. And so those are the four corners, the four pillars. But now let's look to the foundation of social justice. I want to go to part two here. So social justice. It's a popular buzzword today, and definitions abound as to exactly what it means. I remember very early on, even actually while I was in Fort Worth, Texas, um, you know, I, I would say I believed in social justice. But when I would say that, I would mean something completely different by what it maybe we'd say actually means or has meant traditionally. Uh, I responded, well, social justice is just justice at the social level. Uh, but that's a bit redundant. And I'm going to tell you why in a second. But other people will say sometimes that um, social justice just means a redistribution of wealth and power. Uh, and so why is it redundant for someone to say justice, social justice is justice at the social level? Because all justice happens at the social level, because justice is about our relations with one another. Uh, and so it's a bit redundant to add the adjective. Um, so essentially... You know, when we look at justice, there's actually two different kinds. There's universal justice and particular justice. And in both of these, um, universal justice has to do with, we might say, the behavior of a person, their righteous standing uh, in the sense of they act in such a way as to, um, what might we say, um, they act in such a way that's morally upright in society. This universal justice applies to everyone. Everyone should act good, right? That's what we would say is universal justice. But then there's particular justice. And this is defined in three different ways or three subpoints to particular justice, which is commercial justice, remedial justice, and distributive justice. So I'll say those again, commercial justice, remedial justice, and distributive justice. So commercial justice involves uh, the interpersonal relations involving economic exchanges. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, you see like passages of scripture like Leviticus 19.36 and Proverbs 16.11 that oblige merchants to have just scales and weights. Uh, they, this seems directed to this type of justice. Um, the second kind is what's called remedial justice. 
Uh, these are instances where some wrong must uh, be made right under either criminal or civil law. And um, cases where an innocent individual is found guilty or where the punishment for an offense is too severe or too lenient are instances of injustice in this sense. And Exodus 23, 3 through 6 is one of a number, number of, of biblical passages that speaks uh, to the issues of remedial justice. And then lastly, we have distributive justice. Uh, this, is a, this arises in situations where some good or burden is apportioned among human beings. As such situations are encountered frequently, as, for example, when a parent divides the evening dessert among the members of a large family, or a man divides his estate among his heirs. As a term is used in contemporary writings, social justice is viewed as, as that species, listen here, of distributive justice concerned with the distribution of burdens and benefits within society as a whole. A distribution, listen here very closely, that is usually controlled or controllable by political authorities. Uh, this is from a book from 1983 by Ronald Nash called Social Justice in the Christian Church. I laid out those three definitions of particular, particular justice. So Nobel laureate uh, Frederick Hayek, this is what he said in his speech uh, for the Nobel Prize. He said, I have come to feel strongly that the greatest service I can still render to my fellow men would be that I could make the speakers and writers among them thoroughly ashamed ever again to employ the term social justice. Now, why would someone feel so strongly about this goal? Uh, even well-known theologians, by the way, like Wayne Grudem, who wrote, if you haven't read, maybe you've read it for school, but his systematic theology, he wrote also a book on ethics in 2018, is published. And in there, on one a particular page, he gives four reasons why he rejects using the term social justice. I'll link that below. I, I put that on my website uh, and just um, had it easily laid out for people to read instead of buying the book to look it, look it up. Uh, but for the sake of time, I won't go into it now. But he lays out four reasons why. Now, um, I can understand for some of you, you know, I don't, I don't know each of you in your background, but um, when I first heard opposition to the idea of social justice, I was immediately turned off. I didn't want to hear what the person had to say. Um, and so it took a little while, but upon investigating it further and saying, look, I'm just going to study this for myself because I'm responsible for the things I know and, for, and I'm I was, I was at the time preparing to be a teacher of God's word. I was like, well, you know, if this is such a big issue, I need to know why I believe what I believe about it. And so that's my challenge to everyone I always teach is to test what I say, test what everyone says. Don't just take it at face value because you like the person speaking or they're charming or uh, they're rhetorically persuasive or if their arguments for the most part are very good. You know, we have to test everything we hear and uh, test it according to God's word. And so some of you might be turned off that I say I'm against social justice, and the reason why is because social justice is such a positive-sounding term. If I say I'm against social justice, maybe you think, what, is Travis for social injustice? Well, by no means. I'm not for injustice. No way. Um, much of this has to do with what in Antonio Martino points out uh, with this expression of social justice. It, it owes its immense popularity precisely to its ambiguity and meaninglessness. It can be used by different people holding quite different views to designate a wide variety of different things. Its obvious appeal stems from its persuasive strength, from its positive connotation, which allows the user to praise his own ideas. So if we're looking at the foundation of social justice, it's really going to take us back to classical Marxism. Now, I understand that can be a buzzword. I don't use that word lightly. And so I just want to uh, be clear as I get, as I move forward, um, not just trying to be uh, a foolish Fox News host, <laughs> uh, but classical Marxism, that is the foundation of social justice, okay? Now, Karl Marx was an avid atheist. Uh, he co-wrote the book with Frederick Engels, The Communist Manifesto. And just like we looked at the three branches of philosophy as it relates to the Christian worldview, uh, how does classical Marxism answer the question of metaphysics epistemology and ethics. And students, I'm so sorry to mention this at the beginning, but if you have questions, uh, because I can't see your screen at the same time I'm reading my notes, uh, please save them for the end. I would love to answer any questions you might have. Okay, so how would we answer the metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics of classical Marxism? So the metaphysics of classical Marxism is materialism. Materialism, that's the metaphysic. Materialism is the philosophical pre-commitment 
that all things can be reduced to physical matter. There's no spiritual matter. There's no immaterial uh, reality. There's only physical reality. There's no soul. There's no anything. That's, that's metaphysics, according to the classical Marxist. Uh, the epistemology, the epistemology, and uh, if I didn't define that, epistemology is how we know things. It's a study of that. those things that can be ascertained or known. Okay, uh, Epistemology uh, of classical Marxism is positivism. Now, positivism is the notion that science is the foundation of all knowledge, of all knowledge, sciences. Now, um, this comes from the idea of empiricism, by the way. Empiricism uh, is the theory that all knowledge begins and is restricted to that which can be ascertained by sense experience. So only the five senses can tell me the things I can know. Um, and so those are the positivism, yeah, stems from empiricism. And then the ethics, the ethics of classical Marxism is determinism. Now, you might be like, how is that the ethics? Well, let me explain. I'll go in more detail here. Uh, determinism is the philosophical notion that all events are determined completely by the laws of nature that were set in place at the beginning of the cosmos. So um, this one may not be as easy to see, so I want to speak to it specifically. Essentially, if we are just machines and everything we do is determined, then it isn't a matter of needing to be shamed or punished when we do wrong. Rather, we need to be fixed or treated medically. Bertrand Russell, well-known atheist, he wrote the uh, well-known book, Why I Am Not a Christian. He comes from a Catholic background. Um, I've read that book. It's very interesting, his arguments, um, but sadly, very theologically weak. He likes to try to critique scripture in there, and he does a really bad job uh, reading it in context. Um, and that's unfortunate. Bertrand Russell, he, this is what he says about determinism, and essentially, um, instead of being shamed or punished, why you need to be fixed or medically treated. He says, no man treats a motor car as foolishly as he treats another human being. When the car will not go, he does not attribute its annoying behavior to sin. He does not say, you are a wicked motor car, and I shall not give you any more petrol until you go. <laughs> kind of a funny picture. Uh, he attempts to find out what is wrong and to set it right, an analogous way of treating Human beings is, however, considered contrary to the truths of holy religion. So in critiquing, uh, uh, you know, religion, he seeks to actually equate, which is really interesting, right? It shows a lot about his worldview. We, we all understand a car is just a piece of metal and aluminum and, and plastic and bolts and all these kind of things. That's what a car is. But he's saying no one treats a car like a human. Well, of course not, because a car... Is not a human. So, but what's he saying about humans in that? He's saying that we're just machines. That's what his implication is. The humans are just machines. And so, of course, no one's going to say, oh, you know, motor car's wicked. I had my alternator go out a couple of weeks ago. I had to fix it uh, two weeks ago. And uh, it's not like I looked at my car and said, you wicked car, you're supposed to work. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, it just broke. It's a machine. It broke. So what I had to do, I had to fix it. Uh, and so, Anyway, so the, what, what happens here on, on Bertrand Russell's view is this removes any sense of responsibility for wrongdoing. Therefore, the problem with man is he just needs to be fixed uh, from his malfunction. It could be solely the cause of a chemical imbalance. Uh, and if we could just merely balance the chemicals perfectly for the machine to keep going, uh, then we will have solved this problem. Uh, now, and I, I want to be really clear here because I am critiquing a materialist worldview. As a Christian, I'm a dualist, and so I believe in both the material and the immaterial. The material affects the immaterial, and the immaterial affects the material of the person, the body, and the soul. They're, they're you know, united. Uh, we are spa the soul is spatio-temporally located wherever the body is until the body dies, and so they affect each other. So, for instance, if I have a really bad diet, don't exercise, I, I don't get good sleep, that is going to affect my soul, my body, and how I interact how I reason? Am I not thinking as clearly? Uh, am I um, also, do I have a bad attitude? Is that, that's going to influence me toward, we might say, a sinful behavior. And so they, they're both related. And so we don't, we don't deny the material. Just want to be really clear there. Um, so as Johnson states in his book, Jeffrey Johnson, uh, he says this, according to Marx, the ills of society are the result of materialistic and physical illness, not because of depraved and selfish dispositions within humanity. Man's behavior is conditioned by the chemicals in the brain, as well as external, social, and historical factors. So essential, essentially, criminals and those who do wrong are the victims of poor parenting or poor education 
or poorly organized societies. So they're the victims of institutions, essentially here. They're, they're the victims of the external institutions of power. Notice um, we talked about um, things that are in authority above them. That's going to be a really important theme. So the solution for Marxism then is to fix these external institutions of power. For the Marxist, the problem is out there. It's out there. It's outside of uh, the person. So according to the Marxist, it is not within man, as James 4.1 says. Rather, it is within the institutions of society. So this is where you get the, that adjective of institutional sin or systemic sin. Um, and um, this goes contrary to scripture. Uh, though for the heart, it, it's because um, the heart of our problem lies within individual hearts. Uh, do individuals create systems? Yes, absolutely. Um, the systems wouldn't exist without the individuals working them. Uh, so it's not to say that there can't be, um, you know, just using an example, there can't be a very sinful nation. You know, I'm not saying that. So uh, obviously, the idea we all go to right away is the Nazis, the Nazis, right? And uh, of course, they were wicked. The, the the Nazi ideology was wicked, and many and the majority of the Germans in that time, uh, once Nazism rose to power, of course, you know, went along with the Nazi Party. And you know, we would say as a system, it was a sinful system, but the system wasn't at fault. It was the individuals who created the system and who led the system as authorities within it. And so, um, James four one through three. It says this, it says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So really, the source of our problems comes from within us, not from without us. It comes from our passions that are at war. It comes from our heart that covets, that, that yearns and longs for things it does not have. And really, um, we were designed to worship God. And as you understand from the Christian worldview, I'll cover this in a moment as well. We had fallen into sin and sin has so corrupted every aspect of the world. The source of sin is in the human heart. We have, as Augustine uh, famously um, taught, but even others before him, of course, it's in scripture, but uh, the idea of original sin. And this is something that's uh, passed down uh, to everyone from Adam. And then also uh, a good passage that deals with um, personal responsibility, uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, just recommend reading the whole chapter. Uh, it says that, you know, children shall not uh, suffer for the sins of their father, meaning they, should, they won't be punished for the sins of their father. It's the soul who sins shall die. So, of course, there are generational effects to sin. It's not denying that, but rather personal responsibility for sin. It, you know, if, if uh, and actually, uh, I, was, I know this for a fact because I know my family history really well. My, my great, great grandfather owned slaves. That's not okay, right? It's not okay to own a person. Um, that was sinful. But I, I, one, don't, like, I didn't do it. He did. Um, so he should be personally responsible for that. Uh, but two generations, actually three generations before my grandfather, uh, sorry, great, great grandfather um, was um, obviously his grandfather. He was an Irish slave. Uh, I learned that he was severely beaten by his master and a man came across him and saying, is that your father beating you? And uh, he said, no. Uh, he said, I'm a slave, 12 year old boy, slave, Irish slave and a slave in the American colonies, by the way. And um, so that man kidnapped my great, 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 great grandfather and raised him as his own son. Uh, I, I wonder if that master was such a severe abuser, if he would have maybe one day killed my relative and if I would exist today. Um, very sad. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, um, slavery has always existed in, in a sinful world. Um, and sadly, uh, if you follow like... Uh, I remember hearing about at least the statistics through like Louis Giglio and the end it movement, uh, 27 million people are still slaves today. And people are always going to try to seek to enslave people. It's horrific. It's sad. And we as Christians should be at the forefront of standing against it. Um, 
so I don't want to go too far off that path there, but essentially the soul who sin shall die. We have a thing with personal responsibility here. So I need to go quickly here. So uh, from this three-pronged foundation of classical Marxism, consisting of materialism, positivism, and determinism, the infrastructure is then erected. Uh, none of the institutions established by God can remain standing on the Marxist worldview because uh, the individual, the family, the state, the church, uh, these things are um, not, they don't fit well with Marx's framework. So he seeks to eradicate them or eliminate them. Uh, Marx divides society up into two categories, not, uh, we would say, four in the Christian worldview, uh, but he divides it only up into two, and it, that is these two categories, the haves and the have-nots. The have-nots don't have as much as the haves because they've been unjustly oppressed by the haves. In other words, he believed all relations are conflictual in nature and not cooperative. So to be under the authority of another or to work for someone was considered oppression. Marx believed the evil in the world was capitalism and that it needed to be replaced by communism. This could uh, be overcome by the equal distribution of wealth and power in the society. Everyone had to have the same exact amount of wealth and the same exact amount of power. This is the idea called, that's called equity. In other words, equality of outcome. Uh, and, and equality of outcome, equity, is a bad thing but equality of opportunity is a, is a good thing. And we should encourage that e opportunity. We want opportunity uh, for everyone in the, in the right thing. So um, these are all good sounding words, just like the word social justice, but you don't realize sometimes the ideas behind them and how they came about. So um, regarding the infrastructure, individual, church, state, uh, family, Marx, Marx believed in, in the deconstruction of individual rights. So we were what was primary about us was not our individuality, but our group identity. And so we were either an oppressor or an oppressed. We were a have or a have not. And that was essential for Marx and his framework. But Marx also believed in the abolition of the family. Uh, he made this very clear, actually, in the Communist Manifesto. He said, abolition of the family, even the most radical flare-up of this infamous proposal of the communists. Uh, so he, he's really saying, like, look, this is, yeah, this is pretty radical, and I understand that. Uh, and he goes on, and much more could be said, don't have time to get into it, but he has a whole section on abolishing the family. How do you do it? Uh, Marx believed in the deconstruction of the nuclear family and all hierarchies. And what is a hierarchy? Just want to be clear what this is. A hierarchy means the chain of command descending from greater authority to lesser authorities. We would all agree hierarchies exist and that hierarchies are good. Like it's good to have, you know, a president and uh, a leader of our nation and obviously our system of government, but then we'd say it's good that there are police officers, there are authorities. Uh, it's good that you have teachers. It's good that you have pastors. It's good that each of us have a mom or dad. Um, those are good things. Those are good hierarchies. Uh, obviously, all those things can be abused. Um, so we, he believed, Marx believed in the deconstruction of individual rights, the abolition of the family, and also he believed in one day the um, deconstruction of the state, but the means for Marx to achieve his goal was through the state. So he believed in no borders, no distinct national sovereignty, and no classification of people. So regarding the church, Marx believed that all that is holy and solid would melt into thin air under communism. In other words, it would all vanish. There'd be no need for it. So um, now quickly now, I want to move to the looking at the infrastructure that is built on the foundation of classical Marxism, which would be critical theory. Okay, so Randy Trahan, if you don't know who he is, he is a professor of law at Louisiana State University. He is a former critical theorist, and he's actually a member of my church. He's the one who helped me better understand the dangers of critical theory. Uh, he's a Harvard graduate. Um, the editor of the Yale Law Review is the one who turned him on to critical theory. And uh, this is how he defines critical theory. He says critical theory is, prim is a primarily sociological, but also economic and political theory of the conflict variety meaning that it presupposes that social relations are foundationally conflictual rather than cooperative, as opposed to a functionalist or consensus theory, according to which various dominant social identity groups within society, for example, whites, men, heterosexuals, or cisgenders, uh, in an effort to create and then maintain certain social, economic, and political privileges, these are unmerited advantages, these privileges, vis-a-vis -vis competing natural and artificial social identity groups, for example, for people of color, women, homosexuals, and transgenders, uh, the, the um, dominant social identity groups 
according to critical theory, oppress them, oppress the minority uh, groups uh, in various ways and through various means, including the establishment of unjust social, political, and economic structures and systems, above all normative value systems that favor the oppressors at the expense of the oppress, oppressed. So it's a really long definition of incredibly wordy. That's, I guess, what law professors do. <laughs> uh, but a very really short definition I want to give you from Jeffrey Johnson in his book. He says that critical theory is a social philosophy of class warfare that claims language is a social construction used as a means of oppression by those in power and calls for the deconstruction of power structures through the deconstruction of language. Now, I'm, I'm not going to have time to get into the history of how it all developed. I'm trying to give a big overview here. I um, can share, your, share with you links to the video series I did with Professor Randy Trahan, where he deals with the history of it. Uh, but for now, let's just move forward. Uh, so the foundation of um, critical theory uh, really comes from the Frankfurt School and the different guys associated with it. Uh, but really, its foundation for critical theory in these Frankfurt School guys is what was called social Darwinism and social Marxism. Uh, Marx believed that if we could change the economic base of society, we could change the world. But when it wasn't working, the Frankfurt School folks got really upset about it. They were like, why is communism and Marxism not taking uh, over around the world? So the Frankfurt School came to the conclusion that they must change the superstructure of society. And they had to do this through the long march to the institutions. So looking at the same three tenets of the other worldviews, the metaphysic, the epistemology, and the ethics, let's look at that in relation to critical theory. So the metaphysic of critical theory is materialism, so it's the same as the others, but the epistemology and the ethic are different. The epistemology of critical theory is relativism. If you haven't heard of relativism, it's pretty much the idea that truth is subjective and the individual or society determines what is true. So truth is not objective on, on relativism. Uh, so they reject positivism, that we can only know things by science. Then that's the epistemology, how we know things. And then you have the ethic of critical uh, theory. Uh, the ethic is anti-authoritarian. This is rooted in actually Sigmund Freud. And I know I'm talking to psychology majors uh, here, and I, and I know I don't have to spend time diving too much into the three levels of consciousness laid out by Freud, but for our purposes, I'll briefly describe them. He, the id, the unconscious mind, includes one's basic desires and impulses, the ego, which is the conscious mind, which is shaped by society, and then the superego. Uh, the ego uh, is seeking to suppress the id, uh, one's basic desires, and bring them into conformity to the social norms. So Freud, in his anti-authorian approach, believed that guilt kept mankind oppressed, and so this internal war, according to Freud, brought about a false sense of shame, guilt, and frustration. So to cure this conflict, the goal would be to remove the cultural constructs, or according to critical theory, the superstructure, the cultural constructs that bring this about. So this goes back to, um, once again, this relativism and anti-authority posture ethic of critical theory. So on this threefold structure of social Marxism, we have critical theory. According to the Frankfurt School, language was used as a means of oppression. So speech and language, therefore, are oppressive. Uh, also, uh, I want to mention this as well. Critical theory is tied to postmodernism, has its roots there. And so since we cannot uh, know objective truth uh, on postmodernism, you know, truth is dead in that sense. Um, everyone just determines what they want to be true. It reminds me of Judges 21-25. There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Uh, and that's a major problem. Uh, that re the the postmodernist says that reality is confined solely to the material realm and that every individual is the ultimate authority in their life to, de to, to, to determine what is right and wrong for themselves. Uh, Johnson argues in his book that at the heart of critical theory is that any authoritative meaning that passes itself as objective truth is inherently discriminating and oppressive. That's really key. If you want to know the heart of critical theory, it's in a sentence. It's that any authoritative meaning that passes itself as objective truth is inherently discriminating and oppressive. So critical theory then creates this goal of deconstruction. And we might say critical theory is a big umbrella. Uh, so it's going to deconstruct meaning, authoritative meaning, wherever it's found. So let's just jump around. We have uh, law. If we applied critical theory to law, then you have critical legal studies. If you applied it to history, critical history theory. Uh, 
to sexuality, critical queer or gay theory, applied to gender, uh, critical gender theory, so critical feminist theory, uh, and applied to race, critical race theory. So in their conquest to deconstruct any objective meaning, they will rid the world of what they deem intolerant to liberate any so-called oppressed from the unjust bondage of those who are in power. Horkheimer, from the, uh, he's one of the men of the Frankfurt School, gave this chilling quote. He said this, the revolution won't happen with guns. Rather, it will happen incrementally, year by year, generation by generation. We will gradually infiltrate their educational institutions and their political offices, transforming them slowly into Marxist entities as we move towards universal egalitarianism. So how do they accomplish their goals? We got to talk about that. How do they accomplish their goals? Well, instead of going for the individual first, that's really what they would go for last. Um, you'd think that'd be effective, you know, get each individual. What they aimed for was actually the family first. Let's deconstruct the family. And we saw this clearly um, in the sexual revolution of the 60s. It started decades ago. Uh, its goal was to communicate that complementarianism, traditional gender roles and sexuality and parenting all needed to be deconstructed because they were oppressive. Uh, you might remember how I said Karl Marx wanted to change the economic base with well, the Frankfurt School. They wanted to change the superstructure, a big difference. Uh, and these uh, the superstructure are the culture shaping institutions, the family in their mind being the most important one. So Johnson, he quotes Horkheimer to, at length in this, in this uh, uh, book here. And I wanted to read it uh, real quick. Uh, Renee, well, while I just have a second, I'm looking for this page. How much longer do I have? You have about eight minutes. Okay. Woo. I will not read that long quote then because I'll miss out on some good stuff in the end. Um, but I'll reference the book. So um, let's see. I want to close this out with some worldview comparison. Man, but I want to leave questions too. Mm. Okay. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to summarize one last point here from my notes, and then uh, I'll open the floor for questions. Okay. So according to uh, Scott David Allen, social justice is about the tearing down of traditional structures and systems deemed oppressive and the redistribution of power and resources from oppressors to victims in the pursuit of equality of outcome. So to apply to you guys, the objective of social justice in your situation as students would be that every student gets exactly an equal amount of attention from the teacher, that everyone gets equal grades regardless of the amount of effort put in, and that the outcomes for all must be the same. Um, and... Let me see anything else here. I will go ahead and stop there. There's a, I mean, there's so much more I could, I could say and share. So I'll have to share um, the rest of what I have with Renee and she could share with you guys and some resources, but let me go ahead and open the floor for questions. Do we have any questions just about anything I shared today? Well, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, Minister McNeely, for taking time out to share with us. Um, I don't really have any questions because it's all the new information in here. But I, uh, one thing I do know is that um, you were talking about various justices, and I didn't realize there was just so many mm. justices and, you know, at different levels. So I, I learned that. And um, thank you for the scripture. Scripture is always a good thing to receive. Um, so again, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. And uh, I would love for, I'll, I'll have Renee give my email out to you guys. So if you do have any further questions too, um, I have a whole list of resources I've compiled uh, and books I would recommend and would love to recommend those to you guys too. But any other questions? Um, I have a question. I mean, really, I think it's been, I think it's getting more and more prevalent. Just the thought of deconstructing, uh, just so, social norms, social whatever. And I think there can definitely be pros and cons of it. But I just wanted to know, like, thoughts of what are the dangers of just all the, de like, deconstruction of religion, family, whatever, like, pros and, like, dangers of that, I guess. Yeah, so um, you, just to make sure I heard your question right, because it was kind of breaking up, you just want to know what the, the the idea of deconstruction is so prevalent. You're asking about what are the dangers of that, like the results of that 
taking yeah, root. That's, 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 that's. Yeah, he's asking pros and cons, uh, dangers and maybe positives that might come from that. Oh, that's really that's a great question. So obviously the dangers is just the breakdown of society as a whole, breakdown of the family, the state, the church, the individual. Um, those are the dangers. Uh, I wouldn't say there's any positives that come from deconstruction except for the positive opportunity for Christians to uh, make make their case for why um, God and his word and you know his worldview is the best worldview uh, that makes sense of the world we live in. And so um, yeah, it's it's kind of like uh, you think of Joseph uh, in Egypt in Genesis when his brother sold him into slavery, and that was a horrible thing. And he says, "Hey, what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good." And I look at this opportunity. I don't I don't sit here and I'm not hopeless. Like, oh no, all these things are happening. Well, I'm actually hopeful because you know what this has done for me personally. It's made me really assess why I believe what I believe, and because of that, I can you know better articulate it and disciple people better, you know, uh, and encourage them in their faith and. Uh, and also, I can better engage lost people. So there's a there are positives to the deconstruction happening in society in that if Christians take hold of this opportunity, we equip ourselves to reach our world, you know, for Christ. Uh, but yeah, the negatives are, sadly, you know, the deconstruction of uh, the family, state, church, and the individual, ultimately. So. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Anything I could provide further clarity on? I don't think we have more questions, but one, thank you so much. Um, and I'm glad you recorded it. If you send me your links and the email you want me to send out in the Zoom once you have it recorded, I'll make a I'll make a module on our class page. So don't go back and watch it. You can actually see the slides clearly, um, ask questions that you have. So that'll be really, really helpful. And appreciate your time Travis. Yeah, absolutely. It was a joy to be here with y'all and uh thank you guys for uh having me in class today and I hope that I was able to stir your thinking about this subject and uh you know, if there's any lack of clarity on my part, I apologize, but uh also uh want to say hey, contact me and I'd love to clarify any further. So Thank you so much Travis. Yeah, absolutely. Y'all have a great day. All right. So, uh I'm coming back at the end of this uh, lecture I just did for you students and finishing some of my notes so you can continue watching uh, and catch up some of the things I wasn't able to say. Um, part of it maybe because I prepared a little too much, but also uh, I didn't want to leave out some really important details that might be really helpful for you as you're thinking uh, about this important subject. And uh, I know we had some tef technical difficulties in the beginning, which also made it, um, you know, made us lose on some time but I just want to go ahead and walk through a few things. The thing I had left off on before I tried to quickly make my way through this uh, material was how do critical theorists seek to accomplish their goals? And that was through deconstruction and undermining every sphere of sovereignty. And they started first, not going for the individual, but for the family. And so I talked about how Karl Marx wanted to change the economic base, um, but the Frankfurt School saw that that didn't work. So the way to do it was to change the superstructure, the culture shaping institutions, uh, the hegemony. And um, this idea of the hegemony is the notion uh, developed by Italian communist Antonio Gramsci uh, of a, this, the notion of a dominant group imposing its own socially constructed values and knowledge onto marginalized groups in order to maintain power over them. So it's all about power and power dynamics. Um, Really, Johnson in his book, uh, just by the way, fantastic book uh, on just a, really an overview. It's a maybe you could say big picture type thing. Um, on on pages seventy four, he actually extensively quotes uh, David Held in his book Introduction to Critical Theory. He explains uh, why the Frankfurt School was so adamant about the necessity of deconstructing the family. He says the family is the mediator between the economic structure of the, of the order and its ideological superstructure. So that's the bridge. So really, if you want to accomplish Marx's goal, it's through the deconstruction of the family. Horkheimer states this, Max Horkheimer. The family has a very special place among the relationships, which through conscious and unconscious mechanisms influence the psychic character of the vast majority of men. The family, as one of the most important and 
important formative agencies sees to it that the kind of human character emerges which social life requires and gives this human being in great measure the indispensable adaptability for specific authority-oriented conduct on which the existence of the bourgeoisie order largely depends. Notice it's all about authority once again. Uh, and so you have to rid it of that authority. It's anti-authoritarian. So as David Held further explains, he says the birth of capitalism emancipated the family from serfdom. That's S-E-R-F-D-O-M if you don't know what serfdom is. Uh, yet the family retained a pseudo-feudal hierarchical structure as the direct personal dependence of women and children survived in the home. The power of the father was always based on the dependence of others. He had the capacity to give or withhold things that were greatly wanted. Under capitalism, the basis of his authority was, at least for a period, reinforced. Father rules the roost, not only in virtue of his physical strength, but also because he is often the sole breadwinner. The relative isolation of women and helplessness of children in the home strengthens his position. Moreover, Horkheimer claimed that the family perpetuates generational authoritarianism. This is what he says, Horkheimer. The son may think what he will of his father, but if he is to avoid conflicts and costly refusals, he must submit to his father and satisfy him. The father is always right where his son is concerned. The father represents power and success, and the only way the son can preserve in his own mind a harmony between effective action and the ideal a harmony often shattered in the years before puberty's end, is to endow his father, the strong and powerful one, with all the other qualities the son considers estimable. Childhood in a limited family becomes an, becomes an habituation to an authority, which in an obscure way unites a necessary so, social function with power over men. And as if that were not enough, Horkheimer asserted the authoritarianism of the family is at the heart of man's psychological problems. Horkheimer says, the lack of independence, the deep sense of inferiority that afflicts most men, the centering of their whole psychic life around the ideas of order and subordination, but also their cultural achievements are all conditioned by the relations of child to parents or their substitutes and to brothers and sisters. Uh, Eric Fromm, a psychologist and a member of the Frankfurt School, agreed. He said, the instinctual apparatus itself is a biological given, but it is highly modifiable. The, primary, the role of primary formative factors goes to the economic conditions. The family is the essential medium through which the economic situation exerts its influence on the individual psyche. So you have guys like William Reich or Wilhelm Reich, who writes The Sexual Revolution, a book called The Sexual Revolution, and then The Social Function of Sexual Expression. And he claimed this, that only under non-capitalist and non-patriarchal institutions, people could live honestly and industriously. Uh, and cooperatively. And according to David Held, Reich's conclusions as to what could bring about an end of the state of affairs included recommendations establishing the sexual rights of all, including children and adolescents. So really, the problem on the critical theory worldview is the Christian worldview. The Christian worldview must be deconstructed. The family must be deconstructed. It is, as Johnson goes on to expound upon, it is the authoritarian patriarchal father who suppresses the sexual desires of children, keeping the next generation enslaved in an out-of-date morality. I've heard that phrase thrown around, haven't we? Uh, even Wilhelm Reich, who wrote those books by the title I mentioned, I'll say them again, The Sexual Revolution and The Social Function of Sexual Oppression. He said this, we do not conceal the fact that we want to protect children and adolescents from being in, inculcated with sexual anxiety and guilt feeling. So Johnson says, thus for Reich, sexual health can be defined as, here it is, freedom from any kind of ascetic moralizing attitude. So for him, Christianity suppressed sexual desire. It could be further from the truth. I mean, the truth is, um, even this has been statistically been proven, Bradley Wilcox, look at the, um, I forget the organization, but Bradley Wilcox, University of Virginia, uh, it's about, it's an organization or foundation on marriage, but even statistics show that those who are conservative and are, um, who believe in traditional family values, that those families tend to have, and those, sorry, those husbands and wives tend to have a better sexual life and have a more fulfilling uh, sexual relationship. Um, and so, what they're saying here is that Christian morality actually suppresses sex, but actually it, it 
it beautifies it and puts it in its right place. And uh, that's really, um, you know, sad, obviously, that they, they say this, but really, um, you know, when we think about the family and its deconstruction in our society, a uh, critical theory is committed, as Johnson actually says here, he's commi- the critical theory is committed to destroying the traditional family, but it's also uh, bent on removing education out of the home and into the public square. Instruction of the next generation needs to be the responsibility of the state to ensure oppression does not continue to forthcoming generations. As Hillary Clinton once said, it takes a village. It takes a village. So parental rights need to be slowly moved away from parents. I didn't get a chance to cover this, but if you actually even go at one point in this book, uh, in the Communist Manifesto, uh, Marx and Engels provide measures and steps of action. And, um, you know, there's 10 different steps to make communism happen. Excuse me. And uh, one of those, one of those, actually, it's the last one, number 10. It's free education for all children in public schools, abolition of children's factory labor in its present form, and combination of education with industrial production. So the public school system was founded uh, on the communist communist notion uh, for the government to have its hand in raising children. Uh, You can very easily go see this. Uh, with uh, John Dewey, the guy who invented the Dewey Decimal System, and his experience in education is very much against classical uh, approach to education. Uh, but really, um, we see a major danger here, and the family being deconstructed. And I, I could continue talking about that, but just to move on through this lecture, uh, to recall what we covered back in the beginning, let's bring things back around. Uh, is that true biblical justice is based on the universal law of God. And that demands fair treatment and righteous judgment, and it exacts consequences on those who violate the law, on those who violate the law. And that's how, um, once again, in a different way, this is that's a quote from Johnson, that definition of justice, but it really does reflect well on Beisner's definition that I mentioned to you earlier as well. Um, now, what would social justice advocates consider the have-nots to be? We talked about this a little bit as well. Kimberly Crenshaw developed this idea of intersectionality that's based off these different have-nots or different classes. There's women, minorities, immigrants, blacks, gays, uh, Native Americans, uh, and not, but not just those. You have like left-handed people or transgender people, short people, obese people, handicapped people. And the more identities that one identifies with, the more disadvantages and oppression they face it. These identities, they intersect, they come together. And so if you're uh, a a female immigrant who's black and gay and left-handed and short and obese, like you have a lot of intersections coming together. And so your oppression that you face in this intersection is much greater than, so let's just say a white female, right? Um, And it's... This oppression um, is uh, would be labeled things like racism or sexism. Uh, racism, by the way, or these things are always defined as like prejudice plus power. Uh, so on this view, uh, someone who is a minority uh, could not be racist. They could only be prejudiced. We've heard many people who advocate for social justice uh, make that claim. Uh, but nevertheless, um, Racism, true, truthfully, if we're to think about it biblically, um, it's it's simply the idea of showing partiality. So I'm showing favoritism, uh, and also it's it, with a mixture of hatred. So I'm looking at this person that might be a particular skin color, and I would say something negative about that person of a particular skin color, and not even just say maybe do something or whatever racism could be said or done in that sense but it's also done and born out of hatred uh which obviously is sinful it's wrong uh so but they define everything and it relates to power dynamics that's why they want to redistribute power and wealth so i hope at the worldview level from this lecture you can see the fundamental differences from the christian worldview i do want to be clear that this once again is not meant to be comprehensive uh but an overview much more can be said on every facet of what I've covered today. And as a matter of fact, that's why I created the series I did with Professor Randy Trahan. So more could be said. And um, 
uh, he says it there, I can make that accessible to you. Um, just to do a quick worldview comparison, uh, Christianity is a worldview. Uh, it's a comprehensive overarching narrative of reality, and it has four basic acts. We have creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And it answers these questions. Who are we? Well, we are creatures of a holy, good, loving creator God who made everything in the beginning. What is our fundamental problem as human beings? We have rebelled against God. We have sinned against him. And that's the fall, the fall, the cosmic tragedy. Uh, next is the redemption. What is the solution to our problem? Well, God sent his son, Jesus, to bear the penalty of our rebellion and rescue us by dying on the cross for our sins and rising again from the grave and ascending to the right hand of the Father. He rules and reigns from his throne. What is our primary moral duty? It's to love God and therefore love people. And then what is our purpose in life? To glorify God, uh, to, to make his name known. This is the basic story of Christianity, uh, and it's the grid through how we interpret the world around us. Not through our cultural experiences, but we conform ourselves to the word of God. And then critical theory also functions as a worldview, but it's an alternate comprehensive overarching story about reality. Uh, it, there's no creation. Um, on this framework, obviously, if you're going to follow a materialist framework, there, there'll be some reliance on Darwinism, but then again, they don't hold to positivism, they hold to relativism, so that does not necessarily matter. Uh, but the fall for them is oppression. So it's all the different oppression one might face, um, and seeking to answer who we are is just, well, we are simply part of our group identity primarily. So what's primary about me is that I'm white, not that I'm Travis. Um, and so that's, that's how critical theory would look at me. And uh, if you're a minority, it'd be, you know, it's not that you are this individual minority, it's rather that you are um, part of that minority community. That's the most important thing about you, um, which is sad because God made you individually. Um, number, number three, uh, if there's no transcendent creator who has a purpose and design for our lives and our identities, we don't primarily exist in relation to God but in relation to other people and to other groups. Our identity is not defined primarily in terms of who we are as God's creatures then. Instead, we will define ourselves in terms of our race, our class, our sexuality, our gender identity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oppression and sin is, not, is our fundamental problem, and our solution would be activism. It makes me think of John McWhorter's article, Atonement as Activism. Excellent article. Go read that. He's a, he's a classical liberal, but I think he hits the nail on the head as it relates to uh, that aspect of critical theory. Um, you know, we want to change structures. We want to raise awareness, you know, and, and those kind of things. We work to overthrow and dismantle the hegemonic power. That, that is our whole goal in life. Um, so the purpose of life is to work for the liberation of all oppressed people so that we can achieve a state of equality, of outcome, of equity. Okay, that's, that's the goal of critical theory. So, um, Sadly, I and mean, really kind of going back to Johnson here, if you look at page 91 in his book, you know, one of the things he talks about is social justice um, grabbing a massive foothold in our society by focusing on race relations in particular, by appealing to real injustices in our history, real ones like slavery, like Jim Crow laws, those are real injustices that must be condemned. Social justice uh, advocates, so what have they done? They're activists. Well, they were able to exploit the fact that most Americans and professing Christians repudiate such evils and do not want to be labeled as racist. No one wants to be labeled that. Um, and they have done a masterful job of making people believe that social justice is the continuation of the political rights movement led by Martin Luther King Jr., rather than the application of communism as conceived by Karl Marx. But let me be clear. This is a Johnson, not me. This is Johnson. Social justice and critical theory and the gay rights movement are not the continuations of the political rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. was seeking just laws. He was striving for fair treatment of all people, no matter one's ethnicity. He was seeking to confront true racism, which is treating others with prejudice and bias based on the color of their skin. This is evil, and God condemns such partiality. See 1 Timothy 5.21. So social justice, it changes the meaning of justice. It destroys a biblical worldview of justice. Um, 
some people have said, well, maybe we can use it as an analytical tool. That's been a suggestion. If you see episode five of my series, we dive deep into why that can't happen, why that's impossible. I can share that in the links below. But essentially, my critique in that phrase of analytical tool, uh, going a little bit beyond of what we said in that video, uh, is that if we adopt a method, it leads to adopting the metaphysic. The easy way to remember it using the M's, if we adopt the method, it becomes easier to therefore adopt the metaphysic. It won't be long until that actually happens. Um, and so um, really, we have to be really careful with that. Uh, lastly, um, are there true things that critical theorists have said? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they live in God's world. They had to acknowledge some things about reality. Like, um, is it true that oppression exists? Absolutely. It'd be a fool to deny that. There's lots of oppression that happens, but defining what oppression is, is key. Um, and, you know, I, I would say this, um, common grace allows for some of their observations to be correct. Okay. But that doesn't make their interpretation of what they observe correct. There's a big difference that I can, okay, I can see this action happens. It's bad, but also they might interpret more into it because of their framework. Now everyone has frameworks. I acknowledge that I have a framework, but they're not all equally true. We're not subjectivists. We're not relativists. And so objectivity is accessible. It's possible because if not, you can't, I mean, you can't sit here and say no one has objectivity. Well, that's an objective claim. That's an absolute statement, objective claim. How do you know no one has objectivity? There's of course objectivity. It takes work to, to get to that point of explaining what is objective. Um, but we have to realize that there is a, one view, just like two plus two is four. It can't be five. It cannot be five. It's always four. There are fixed laws in our universe, fixed laws of logic, math, mathematics, all that. But common grace, like I said, it allows for uh, into people to think intellectually. Uh, that's God's grace to people, to all people, that they have physical provision from him. It rains on the just and the unjust. They have moral provision. They realize that right and wrong, they understand right and wrong. We talked about that in the beginning. But also they have intellectual provision. They can think right thoughts. But their interpretation and their suggested interventions are affected by the noetic effects of sin. Noetic means effects of sin on the mind. And so that has to be considered. Um, so I'm going to share a list of resources. Um, I'll, I'll link those to you guys. Just want to recommend a few books at the get-go here. Um, we have this book by James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose, Cynic Cynical Theories. Uh, these, these guys are incredible. They do an excellent job in this book explaining the dangers of critical social justice. Um, this is one I haven't read, but Vody Bakum has recommended. It's called America's 30 Years War. It's going to deal with social justice, but other things in here as well. I want to recommend that to you. Um, another book here I'd like to recommend is uh, Fault Lines by Vody Bakum. Uh, Vody does an excellent job in this book of dealing with critical social justice, and he teaches sociology actually as well at the university he's at. Um, there's a newer book here by Matthew Lohmeyer. He was the lieutenant colonel in the United States Space Force who was relieved of his command because he exposed Marxism in the military. He said, Irresistible Revolution is the name of the book, Marxism's Goal of Conquest and the Unmaking of the American Military. Um, so he chronicles that in the, in the book as well, uh, which it's you know a very specialized approach, um, looking at the military in particular, but nevertheless might find very interesting. Uh, last... Not lastly, I got a, two more here I want to recommend. This is The Madness of Crowds, Gender, Race, and Identity. Douglas Murray is not a believer as well, just like James Lindsay. They're not believers in Christ. Um, but he does an excellent job in this book with this subject of gender, uh, race, and identity. And um, I just want to highly recommend his book to you as well. I know he's uh, even been on uh, Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Uh, you can see that his interview there. It's fantastic. Uh, and then this one was recommended by Daryl Harrison and Virgil Walker of the Just Thinking Podcast. This is The Myth of Race, The Troubling Persistence of an Unscientific Idea uh, by Robert Wald Sussman. I believe that some of this had to do, at least it, there might be a connection somehow to National Geographic, unless it's a separate study. It may not be, but um, look, I think this book is really good. It's actually even, pu it's published by Harvard University Press. Um, biological races do not exist and never have. Ooh, that's a big claim on the back. And uh, this is, they say this is a pseudoscientific. So uh, if you're really interested in this, you might find it 
uh, and a helpful resource for y'all linked all that below, but I want to thank you for your attentiveness. And, uh, also, um, just want to really encourage you, uh, to think in ways in the ways of Christ and worldview. And I hope that, um, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments below. You could reply, uh, to the email I'm about to send you as well. If you're, um, from the class I taught and, um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope you were blessed by this time together. Thanks.